I think over to okay. you. Let's go. Well, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our launch for Women Who Led the Way, Great Explorers and Adventurers. Um, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Mick and Britta, Mick Manning and Britta Grandstrom. Um, I've worked with them for many years from when I was at Francis Lincoln, publishing books like The Secrets of Stonehenge and William Shakespeare and lots more. Um, and I was so proud to be able to bring them onto the Otter Barry list um, with, with books, books, books initially, their book about the British Library and then the history of prehistory, a uh, fantastic book too. And now, um, Women Who Led the Way. Um, Mick and Britta are a unique partnership, never met authors and illustrators like them before, completely unique husband and wife team. They just have this magical way of imparting information to children uh, in a fun, simple, stylish, personal way. Um, they're very story focused, um, illustration focused, um, and children are riveted by their books. They really are totally engaged. Um, and the other thing is, I'm sure we'll talk about this, is they both do both story and illustration <laughs> in, a, in an amazing way. I uh, can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you as ever to the Otter Barry team, Gail, Katerina, Tatty, Laura, Jude, Jade, our new social media person, and Jill, um, and especially designer Rebecca Watson and Sophie Pelham, um, and Mick and Britta's agent, Lucy Jukes, who, who played a very important role editorially. Um, and now thanks so much, Nikki, for hosting us again. We love your events and um, uh, I think we're all in for a treat, a treat in store. So over to you, thank you. We definitely are. And before we get going, um, just to the audience, uh, please do use the chat as usual to introduce yourselves. It's great to see so many names uh, that I know uh, in the audience this evening. So please do uh, introduce yourselves via the chat if you want to. And of course, you're very welcome to make comments um, as we go through. Uh, we will be taking questions and we'll be using the Q&A facility. As always, that's at the bottom of your screen. So don't use the hands up, uh, but do use the Q&A uh, facility. Now, Jeanette has already introduced Mick and Britta this evening, and we are celebrating the launch of this very handsome, it has to be said, book, women who led the way. But I think it's also true to say that Mick and Britta have themselves been pioneers, pioneers in the publishing of nonfiction for children. It's always engaging and informative. And since the publication of The World is Full of Babies in 1995, could it really be that long? They have consistently produced well-researched books about the natural world, the arts, history, science, and outstanding biographies. They always frame the subject in ways that are both appealing and accessible. And in 2020, it's no surprise that they won the SLA, the School Libraries Association, Hachette Award for outstanding contribution to information books. Now, our event this evening is going to take a slightly different format. We're not starting with Q&A. Mick and Britta are going to present, and then we will have a short interview, plenty of opportunity for audience questions, and I think we've even got a reading planned for the end uh, of the evening. So, uh, over to you, Mick and Britta. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. So we've come to you today to talk about a new book, Women Who Led the Way, Great Explorers and Adventurers. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about some amazing women explorers who have changed our world, Tra trailblazers from Viking Queen Ord, the Deep Minded, to space explorers like Mae Jameson. And to, together, we, um, I'll, I'll read some of my favourites, but then I thought together we could draw some of the characters. Or you can just watch Greta draw. Yeah, if you so, don't have a pen and paper, don't worry. Just sit back and enjoy Greta drawing. So I'll start with reading from some of my favourites. So at this point, I'm going to pick up the camera. I'm not 
really brilliant at Zoom, so forgive me if it wobbles around for a minute, but then I'm going to film Brita, then I'll come back for questions, okay? All right, let's go. So let's start with Ford the Deep Minded. She was an early voyager to Iceland. Let's hear what Ord has to say. I was always strongful and strong-willed. And my father, Kettle Flatnose, was the Viking ruler of the Hebrides. My son, Toshten the Red, became a great warrior. He conquered the north of Scotland and had six beautiful daughters. We settled there until Torsten was betrayed and killed in battle. With traitors everywhere, it was no longer safe for us. I thought long and hard, what could a grandmother do? Then I had the answer. I had a ship built in secret and with a crew of 20 loyal warriors, I captained a voyage of discovery and escape. We sailed north over mountainous waves to Iceland, the edge of the known world. So that's just one of the amazing women we've written about in this book. My next favorite is Jean Barré. Excuse my French. Let's hear what she says. She says, let me tell you what I did for love. In 1765, Philibert Commerson, the man I loved, was invited to be the ship's naturalist on a round the world expedition under Captain Bougainville. I wasn't allowed to go because no women were allowed on sailing ships in those days. But Philibert knew the Navy would allow him to take a servant. So we hatched a daring plan. Philibert would hire a young manservant, me. Let's see who else we can read about in the book. We're coming to another favorite of mine, Mary Anning. She was a pioneering fossil explorer. Mary Anning, from six years old, Mary was a father's fossil collecting assistant. Fossils are prehistoric creatures or plants whose remains become buried in the mud, salt or silt. Over millions of years, this becomes rock. Mary went out to dodge high tides and survived cliff landslides, searching on her own or with a friend, Elizabeth Philpott to bring the world her discoveries. Yet, she was never given the credit she deserved in her lifetime. Right, okay, we come to the first live drawing. So if you got your papers and pens ready, I would love you to follow me because this is what we've done with these school classes. I'm gonna start with a nice big egg like so. And in the egg, we do a a <laughs> smaller egg. There we go. Is that we've got Mary's face. And we did two eyes like so with two bows over. With some lashes. And then the little nose. And then we do the mouth. Up and down and up and down, like I said to children, with a little half moon underneath. In the bonnet, we would have a little cap. So we do wibble, wobble, wibble, wobble, wibble, wobble, like that around the edges. And then I think we need to do Mary's hair. She'd have a side parting, like so. I feel in her eyes as well. Oh, she started to look really pretty, doesn't she? Well, being out on the beaches, could you imagine doing all that fossil hunting in the bonnet and long skirts? 
Let's do her hair flowing in the wind, like so. And tie her bonnet with a ribbon. And let's make the ribbon fly in the wind as well, look, like so. And what's, I, she, what's she gonna hold, Brita? She's gonna hold something. Yeah, I think she'll need to hold one of her big fossils. Let's do that. A circle and a smaller circle inside. And then we draw a line to connect. This is the eye of the huge fossil she found. Is it an ichthyosaur? It is an ichthyosaur, really long. Like so, we'll make a smiley fossil look like that. When they found it, the scientists at first thought it was a crocodile. Do the teeth and get her arms down. Like that. Let's make her hold her fossil. So we go, make your hands go up, down, up, down, up, down, and round like that. Let's make her some gloves. I hope you are drawing. It's a great fun. Nikki's not drawing. I'm watching Nikki now, and yeah. she's not drawing. How can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> you're on the big screen i hope we're doing this right you're on big screen and we're on little screen is that oh, okay no you're on big screen for me oh that's good you're on big screen for me so here we go we got mary anning with her fossil in the wind yeah did you enjoy that i think she needs a round of applause even though we can't hear them <laughs> great <laughs> Okay, let's go back to some more reading. So, like I said before, there is loads of amazing trailblazing women in this book. Uh, just picking out a few. So my next favorite to talk about is Bessie Coleman. She was the first woman of African American and Native American descent to hold a pilot's license. Let's see what she's got to say. To cut a long story short, when I was old enough, I moved to Chicago to live with my brothers and got a job in the nail bar. I wanted to be a flyer but flight schools in the USA didn't admit women of African-Americans back then. So after a course in speaking French, I worked hard to raise money to go to Europe for flight lessons. And in 1921, I became the first black woman to get a pilot license. I wanted to earn my living as a barnstormer a daredevil stunt flyer. Bessie was a fearless adventurer, often hanging from the wings in her barnstorming circus performances. She led the way for women, and especially black women, to become pilots and ultimately astronauts. Right, we come to the next drawing. Let's clear the deck for Bessie Coleman. Nick has disappeared now. It's just you and a little screen in the corner. So I think it's just you and me now. Right. Let's start with doing. Don't worry, Mick. I'm still here. Yeah. This is flying helmet. That's good. Like so. And then we do her face a half moon like that. And we do a nose. Up, down, up, down, up, down, like so. And two circles for her eyes. She's really pretty, this woman. I do a little lace, uh, lashes as well. Right, with her little mouth, up and down, up and down, up and down, like that. Dimples? I think she had some dimples, like so. Yeah. And on her flying cap, she would have had some goggles. So let's add some goggles. So a rectangle within a rectangle, like so. And let's make her hair fly in the wind when she's flying. 
That looks good. And the, the flaps of the flying cap would have gone flying about as well. Do a mech going down like that. And she would have had a lovely silk scarf, I think, which she was flying with a balsam. And that would be flying in the wind too. I want some tassels. Yeah, we yeah, some tassels. Some tassels. tassels? That. That's good. Um, what else? She would have needed to have a really quite thick coat on. So we do a sheepskin flying jacket for her. Collar like that. There we go. Like that. Right. That's lovely. And being Bessie, I think we'll do what I did with the shoes. Yes. We take her off, lift off your paper, and children always love this bit. And let's make you do loop the loop or the figure of eight. Like that. Right. Okay. Back to the stories. The next amazing woman I'm going to uh, read to you about is Lee Miller. Let's hear what she has to say. She was a pioneering photojournalist. I became the most popular fashion model in New York, phot photographed by the leading fashion photographers of the day, but these were all men. Why, I wondered, couldn't I earn a dime as a woman photo photographer? So I learned from the best. Everything changed with the outbreak of the Second World War. I was living in London where Vogue magazine asked me to be the official war photographer. I explored the ruins of bombed out streets, photographing the devastation to show American people what was being done to Europe by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi forces. Another, another amazing woman that I'd like to read to you about and um, is Jane Goodall. Let's hear what Jane Goodall's story, uh, what she has to say. She was a trailblazing naturalist and conservat cons conservationist. Conservationist, sorry. <laughs> when I was very young, my father gave me a life-size toy chimpanzee called Jubilee. Family friends were horrified and thought it would give me nightmares, but Jubilee gave me the sweetest of dreams. And later those dreams came true. My groundbreaking research showed that wild chimps have personalities with thoughts and feelings, just like our own. I gave them names, David Greybeard, Gigi and Frodo. So I thought, why don't we draw one of Jane's chimps? That's our next mission. So I want you to start with the peanut shape, like so. And then a circle in that then, and then two half moons, like so. Let me do the little shaky mouth. And the nose and the eyes. Oh, he's lovely. And then some lines underneath his eyes, like so. And then ears. And what's missing? His lovely hair. So chimpanzees got a lovely sort of middle party. So we do his hair coming out like that. And 
and not to mention his beard. <laughs> I like him. And some dots on his chin. Can we see him? Looking Bye. good. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. I think it might be Frodo, that one. Shouldn't you be holding something too, Brita? Oh, yes. Yeah. When we do this for school classes, we make him hold a... Can you guess? Maybe a banana? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here we go. You've done this before, Nikki. <laughs> Just while you're doing that, we've got a question that um, from Sean Edwards, which seems like a good opportunity to ask yeah. it now. He's asking you, how did you decide which women to include? And did mm. you have to leave out somebody that you really wanted to include? Oh, that's a good question. It was mm. quite hard, actually. Yeah. Because obviously, um, but with the title of the book, we had to restrict ourselves to explorers and adventurous mm. uh, so that's a way to 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 slim it down yeah but, but there, what, yeah there what, were lots there were, actually but, um and i don't know how many people know about like book production but it's not like a novel doing a children's book where you know you write you know thousands and thousands of words and the publisher just makes the pages to fit we start out with Jeanette and she's really tough, aren't you, Jeanette? And she says, we well, could only have 42 pages. So yeah. that translates as so many spreads. And that means some people have to go. You know, we obviously make a list of far more people than we can fit in. And then we, we edit it down. So um, perhaps a good example would be Diane Fossey. Yeah, I can show you. Show you which yeah. we'd have loved to have had in as a full spread, but we had already got one sort of primate expert so Diane did sort of scrape in but but as a fact box rather than a full spread but so the, um, so the, yeah. way, the way we've sold it is when there was uh, women we couldn't get we made little fact boxes yeah so quite a lot of uh, extra yeah. amazing women got <clears throat> in that way um yeah, and the other, I suppose, while we're talking about it, the other, the other thing which was very important to us was to make the book very diverse and mm. to show women from all walks of life and all parts of the world would have, it was far too easy once when we began the research to, to make a book which, which was just about sort of heroes of the empire. Mm. And obviously that's not what we wanted to do. Um, and so some of those characters didn't make it to the final edit but um we're very happy with uh, we think we've got a good balance of um nationalities and um walks of life in there and so, also there's a chronology so you've covered a broad yes, span of time yes, as well that's a good point we decided to make it chron chronological as a way of uh, of making the page turn because you know that's always one of the early things you have to map out with a book how what is it that that sort of dictates the page turn so we decided to start more or less a thousand years ago with a with a viking princess who discovered iceland um well not discovered iceland but she took christianity to iceland um and then work our way through so mm. yeah you make a comment in the book about iceland in particular as being a place of strong women because of their history I think yeah well I think it is from the history and the Vikings were one of the first um societies to give women well I wouldn't say equal rights but seriously a lot more rights than say the Anglo-Saxons gave women Viking women were allowed to divorce and to own their own land and inherit property um, so yeah, they, Iceland was one of those countries where strong women kind of got a foothold. Mm. So sorry, Britta, I didn't want to hijack what you were doing, but I thought no. Sean's question was a really good one. It was one. a good There's question. A really yeah. good question. <laughs> I think we've just got May Jameson to talk about now, and then we can do questions, proper questions. Mm -hmm. So um, 
uh, I thought I'll finish off by talking about Mae Jameson, the first black woman in space. Um, her story reads, I was raised in Chicago and I loved school, especially maths. I wanted to explore space like my childhood heroes in the TV series Star Trek. So I applied to NASA and in 1987, out of 2000 applicants, I was one of only 15 people selected. Then in 1992, I was chosen for an eight day space mission on board the space shuttle Endeavour. I orbited Earth 127 times and logged over 190 hours in space. Heroes inspire all of us. And I carried a photo of Bessie Coleman with me in space. During my mission, I began all my communications with the planet Earth by quoting another hero. I would say, hailing frequencies open. And that was the catchphrase of my favorite Star Trek character, Lieutenant Uhura. <laughs> A lot okay, of popular think, culture coming in with the serious yeah, history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we'll probably stop there for now and then we can talk some more, yeah? Yeah, that would be good. Right, hang on. So Mick, it looks like yeah. you were really enjoying your um, film directorship there. Oh yeah, <laughs> wiggling the camera around. Yeah. yeah. I do want to ask you, actually, um, at what point in this project did you decide to write first person so that you are in the voices of this, these women? Mm -hmm. um, quite early on, because we didn't want it to be our voice. We wanted to try and give these women um, their own voice and their own opportunity to, to tell their story. Uh, partly because it, it's that direct approach it's much, we've found in our experience it's much more um, captivating for children to read mm. that in the first person mm. that's really so, interesting yeah absolutely because you're giving them thoughts as well as recounting their exploits if you like yeah it's an opportunity to 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 sort of bring try and bring their thoughts to life um and make them real people you know make bring those people who are most of them long gone now to life yeah and quite a lot of uh, the text is about their childhood and their beginnings and i think yeah. that's really uh as a child i think you can relate to that i mean like uh bessie she started in the nail bar i think that's really quite fun mm -hmm. <laughs> So this isn't actually the first time that you've written about pioneering women. I mean, some of your biographies are about yeah. pioneering women and the Brontes yeah. would be one. The Brontes, um, the Brontes is a special book for us because it, it's one of our kind of favourite books. Of, there's lots of favourite books, but we've done loads. But I grew up in Haworth. Um, and I went to Howard School in the 60s, which was then still very much in, in the sort of Edwardian, you could almost say Victorian era. All the teachers were near retirement. They'd all started out as ink monitors. They all had, you know, all gave you the slipper or the ruler. Um, and it was quite terrifying at first because I went, I, I started there in second year after a, a very cosy sort of, um, progressive 60s school in town but then we moved up to Haworth and I found myself in this um, amazing school with a, with a, the headmaster still wore a mortarboard and we still use you know we use biros in Keithley I got to Haworth and they were using dip pens um, in in little inkwells in the desk and we I had to go to the head and get a bottle of ink every week to fill up the inkwells and I looking back I bet you put a lot of blotting paper in those ink wells. A blotting paper. And, but looking back on it now, it was amazing and, and a, such a formative time yeah. for me growing up because it felt, how it then felt like the Brontes had never left. Um, and so anyway, 
so the book was like like huge for me to do because it was it's sort of partly autobiographical um i was in i was this the bbc did um withering heights in the 60s with peter sasdy the old um, hammer horror director and it had ian mcshane as heathcliff and but the little boy that was playing the shepherd boy at the end who sees the ghosts at the very end scene he got sick i think he caught a cold because it's so cold up there <laughs> and they came to howard school and i got I got the job. So I got to be in this amazing, amazing production. And I think that really burnt, burnt something in there about the Brontes. And, and I think for, for, for my point of view, um, it was uh, after doing uh, everything from Charles Darwin to Charles Dickens, it was the first really focusing on women, really strong women, all three of them mm. and do the research. It was just brilliant, wasn't it? And we, you, think, you know, we is that did, where we all... is that where um, women who led the way was that the sort of yeah starting point for you thinking it about it? In many ways, it was because we we started off by doing a lot of research, which we always do for our books. But we went up to Bronte Parsonage, the museum there, and talked to all the experts, and they led us behind the scenes, and we were able to hold these tiny gloves that Charlotte had worn, and it was just amazing. Um, and that inspired us to do the book. And the way we see the way we see it with children's books is if you if you're not in love with the subject yourself, yeah. it's very hard to make a convincing, genuine book. That how can you expect children to love it? Because when we when we work, we get we get really excited about the project, and we sort of eat, sleep, and eat the project. <laughs> I can yeah. tell that. <laughs> It's I'm, just the way it goes. It's, it's yeah. Different. And then we did the words, with, which was a sort of follow on, but again, another strong woman. Um, it's through Dorothy's eyes. And, through, and it, the yeah. book is about, it's about William, but it's really through Dorothy's eyes. And after mm -hmm. reading the book, you realize just how important Dorothy was. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So, yeah. And again, we had an amazing time doing it. And we really loved it. Mm. Brilliant. I'm going to ask our audience to do keep putting questions in the q and I'm going to carry on because I've got more questions for you, but I just want to remind them that they can do that. So we've talked about these great women figures from history, uh, but I also think, Mick, that you have been inspired by women in your own family. I mean, I really love yeah. Taff in the WAF. Mm -hmm. um, did you discover anything when writing that story that you didn't previously know about your relatives. Um, yeah, very much. So that, that it's my mum's story. Um, and we started out doing my dad's story. He was in the RAF. We did task, we did um, Tail and Charlie, who's a tail gunner. And at the end of that book, he meets my mum, which uh, these are, and both that book and this book are kind of inspired by all the stories I was told by them as a boy myself. And I, I wanted to pass those stories on first to my kids. We've got four sons and I've got a daughter. Um, but also once we started, we thought, well, children, children should, all, all children should find this really, really interesting. So after Tail and Charlie was success, we um, talked to Janetta about doing uh, Taff in the WAF at Francis Lincoln. Um, and what I discovered, the reason we did the book really is because my dad always told me about his war stories um, um, in the sense as, as messages of peace really but my mum just always sort of shrugged her shoulders and said oh yeah well I was a wireless operator in the WAF but it wasn't until the 1990s she suddenly decided to tell to tell us all that she'd been um, a listener at Bletchley uh, for Bletchley uh, working from Chicksands which was a secret listening base and she'd had to sign this official um, secrets act so she'd always kept it quiet I don't think she would even told my dad um, and so it all came out in the 1990s and she's still a bit worried I think you know, she's 96 now bless her but in this she started to tell me this in her 80s when we did the book 
Um, but sometimes you'd still say, oh, Michael, I'm, I'm worried there's going to be a man in a, in a long white coat come to the door because I've, I've told these secrets. So it was, it was great fun to do because it was like a voyage with my mother um, and discussing it with my mum. And because it was me, her sort of middle son, um, some days she'd be really enthusiastic. And then some days she'd go, oh, Michael, I just can't remember anymore. <laughs> and that's just because she couldn't be bothered to talk to me. <laughs> but then I'd go back another day and she, she'd tell me loads more facts. So it was great fun. And it was um, we tried to get that kind of first person voice into the into the story. Mm. Well, you know, when Jan Janetta introduced you, she said that you're a partnership like no other. And it's true that you're your creative partnership is so well established I mean I think of your names as one name really <laughs> um I just wonder what you admire in each other's work <laughs> it's a bit of a tricky question well I can start I I really um uh, in my mix way of writing the lyrical text he creates around these subjects we're so excited about and obviously all his drawings of uh, uh, live animals and all this uh, nature drawings but I think you know like you've said before it we we work so closely together and um, we start off with paper and we both draw on the sheets of paper and comes come up with ideas on some books we actually draw on the same artwork and and in some books we're for example, in Nature Adventures, it became quite logical that Mick did all the animals and I did all the people. Yeah, I have to be careful what I say now because this this could be potentially the end of a twenty-five year old <laughs> partnership, couldn't it? But I, I didn't I really ask admire... you. I asked you what you admire. So you're going to say yeah, something positive? That, that's so safe. It has to be positive. I admire that Brita can. Um, bring out so much humanity and character when she draws people. Um, I studied at the Royal College of Art um, Natural History illustration, so I'm really confident about drawing animals and plants and birds and you name it. If it moves, I can draw it apart from human beings. And Brita is so good at that. That's right. So it, it is a good um, combination, yeah. And yet when we look at the page, we don't feel that we're looking at two different illustrators working on this. If you hadn't said <laughs> that, it, it feels That's like good. a unified I think we image. did, uh, initially, when we first started working together, we did try and sort of uh, homogenise slightly so that, so because we didn't want it to be, we wanted one voice See, yes. and it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Bob Godfrey, the, the I shouldn't need to say who Bob Godfrey is, but God, Bob Godfrey, the, the father of, of um, Henry's cat and rhubarb, he once said to me, you're like Morecambe and Wise. I can't see the join. <laughs> Isn't that Which great? I, yeah. I mean, it's thinking back a little bit, but can you remember those adjustments that you had to make in order to create this more well, organised look? I think it all happened quite... Um, easily because the projects we had quite a few projects yeah. on the go and like everything if you do it more than once it all sort of streamlined and like I said before we, we sit with the layout pad and then we say you, you know we, we how all, can we do this how or, can we do this yeah. and this will be better if you do that would be better if, if I do and mm. then you know in that process I think it just comes with working and I, together I think so long. also de depending on what the sort of subject matter is that can also dictate the, the sort of way we do it what media we choose yeah uh, with biographies and books like um, women who led the way it's a lot of watercolor but earlier on when we were doing um that book how did i begin mm. which is sort of infamous um, <laughs> we use a lot of we use a lot of collage and line work um, a flat colour, and then which we were we were delighted to return to with um, Jeanette, with Janetta's yeah. book about prehistory. So we were using. Um, hang on, I'll find a good one. I like the end papers. No, we're not looking at those. Just 
it's so women did... it's called women who led the way mick <laughs> <laughs> not always <laughs> Um, this one, we had great fun because we found all these old Victorian encyclopedias with these amazing sort of line drawings and engravings of volcanoes and meteor showers. And so we, we sort of had fun cutting and collaging and montaging those mm -hmm. with um, line drawings. That's something we so when we have talks uh, to uh, students or up and coming illustrators, we obviously say, well, our advice is don't get pigeonholed, you know, explore and have fun. And I think you're allowed to change your medium. You know, your yeah. voice should be strong enough to come through anyway, you know. That's my favorite one. Wow, that okay. is a, I know what that's called, but I can't remember. Remind me. Well, I have to read it now because I it's always Ignatius. Think it's, it's a rhizodont. Oh. And what's really exciting about that is on our beach, we live in Northumberland. I found about 10 years before this book, 10 years ago, I found a rhizodont fossil on the beach, oh. which is now excavated and in the Hancock Museum. And it's a it, literally a five meter predatory fish from mm. the from the um carboniferous mm. so that's Amazing. particularly why i like that picture. <laughs> it's a bit like mary Anning. yeah it's work it does um the idea of working with different materials different media for different books does that keep it quite playful for yourselves and yeah. enjoyable Very much yeah, so. yeah. and I, I think that word playful is a really good a good word for us because we yeah we, we do have get, fun and we do play a lot yeah we need to be excited about it and 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 that comes with it exploring new things and changes and then think oh maybe we can change this around and mm. stuff like that because we you know we talk about style and sort of visual voice brita's got a big exhibition on in london just now which is paint of paintings and and i paint and um make so uh mm for exhibition of natural history um, and those are very our styles there are very different our visual voices are our own and very different yeah. and they come together in our books and you can i think you can still see it's us but they're sort of homogenized i think they feed each other don't they yeah and i think books book illustration and and our what you might call fine art mm. um they feed one another so mm. If we're not doing a book and we're doing some painting, mm. then that really nourishes our creativity when we come back to do more yeah. graphic graphic work, yeah. as in illustration, Applied. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm. Really, really fascinating. And who comes up with the ideas? Is it just a joint melting pot? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll sit down and talk and say oh would that be fun or that would be fun or you know we've we've and sometimes we think it's a great idea but are either our agent lucy or publishers um saying no we don't think so we wanted to do um jane austen to follow on from wordsworth but no nobody, nobody seems <laughs> no interested in jane austen unfortunately <laughs> but we know we'd make a beautiful book but obviously publishers don't think they could sell that beautiful book well, with the, with this book, for example, um, we, we it just coincided with um, uh, where I come from on my farm. We found uh, loads of photographs from my great great aunt Hedvig, and um, within those photographs, which were amazing in themselves, because a female uh, doing photographs in the eighteen eighties is just very rare. Anyway, we found one of our heroes in here. She's called Esther Blenda Nordstrom. Nordstrom. So she she's in this book. So we were so excited about that, finding her in one of my aunties. So she's sitting with another woman on this huge, huge um, Indian scout motorbike. So finding that, we were really excited. And that coincided with Janetha saying, uh, mm. Would you like to do a book about strong women? And we thought, yeah, and she'll be there, you know. So that was a good mm. start for this one. Yeah. Rita, can you just tell us about the 
uh, woman on the front cover and the the large image there because she's the most recent in the book. Yes, the climber. Yes. So I've already sort of told you about uh, Esther Blender, which won me here. But the, the, my ultimate hero, I think. I think and, we both felt that she was just amazing. She was called. She's called Arunima Sinha, and the. Shall I say? Sorry. Yeah, you can see. She was this, she, well, she is this amazing woman that um, she was volleyball champion and um, she was selected to be in the Indian Special Police Force. And on her way for her sort of final interview on the train, she was attacked by um, robbers, um, thieves. And she, being her, she fought back. But tragically, that ended up with her being thrown off the train. So she went under the under the train and had to have her leg amputated, um, which is dreadful, uh, especially for someone who's so physical uh, as she was. Um, but she she learned to walk with a prosthetic limb. Um, she climbed uh, Everest, and she's now a motivational motivational speaker. speaker we've just found her story so inspiring uh, yeah um when we last spoke um which i think was probably about 10 years ago um i remember us you know as people do we were sort of lamenting the rather lackluster <laughs> publishing of children's non-fiction but i think it's true that we have seen big changes possibly yeah. prompted by threats from digital media, mm -hmm. uh, digital technology. You, on the other hand, have been very steadfast in your approach. You haven't been swayed by trends and fashion. So I wonder if you can tell us what the most important considerations for you are in creating books for young readers. Ooh, well... Well, I think that to answer that question would be that from our point of view, I can't speak for other people, but we we can only do, we can only make books that we're really interested in. Um, we've had offers from publishers to do books, you know, about, or oh, would you like to do a book about, I don't know, let's say maths or something. <laughs> or, and we, we just, you know, that's, maths might be amazing and fantastic i'm not saying it's not it's just that personally we're not and we always try and we always find subjects that we love and most of 99 percent of our books we've done have come from us there are ideas and what would we like to do the next yeah. week or well, what about that or yeah. um and because it you know i think we said before if if you're not interested in it how can you expect children to be interested in it absolutely Joe Bowers has a question for you. Again, it's um, about selection in a way. It says mm -hmm. you must find out so much, so much from your research, yeah. so much, so many fascinating and interesting things about a historical person. How on earth do you decide to whittle it down, and um, what do you decide to include? That is the really, really hard thing. Because, you know, before we do one of these books, read all these fantastic facts. And and uh, in the beginning, you think this is impossible. You, you can't put that in the book. It's not. It's good. But slowly but surely, uh, we sort of whittle it down. Can you imagine trying to write that? The history of the history <laughs> from the beginning of the universe to the first written word in, I don't know, four, I think it was 42 pages because it, the, the different book um books obviously you get different problems you know mm. where to get you know yeah um, we did a, a world war one book for example mm. which it, it was so much gross in fact how do you do it and things like that. but we always see it we've got all these piles of ideas and then all that enormous amount of research and at that point it's quite exhausting it's like this huge mm -hmm. <laughs> huge ball to push up, push up the a hill, hill. and yeah. we're doing roughs after roughs and see how we could spread it out obviously 
um, I suppose how to whittle it down. What do we do? We do we sort of do headlines. What we need to have in it. And then yeah. Then then when we've whittled it down as much as we can, that's when Jeanette Otterbury <laughs> and her partner David <laughs> really earn their percentage yeah. because they they're brilliant editors mm. and um, they mm. really really do help get mm. getting it down and. You know, I've had email conversations and I've come away going, oh, no, they want us to take that away, Brita. And she goes, oh, no, they don't, do they? And then <laughs> we stop and we'll think about it and go, oh, no, well, actually, they're right there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that makes complete sense. That's why it's so So it, it is a team yeah, effort. It exactly. isn't just so that it's, yeah. it's our editor yeah. and, yeah. But it's also true that a picture tells a thousand words is that the saying so actually That's you might have point. all this yeah. information but yeah. you get so much into a, an image yeah. Yeah. that's um, right that, that's a good point to bring up yeah that when we when we are editing we often do that we say well look we don't need to say that those four, four paragraphs because that illustration shows that yeah or, yeah um, and, and what and about that, the dialogue where did the because you you include dialogue in most of these books yeah um <laughs> Yeah, tell yeah. us about how that came about and also what that adds. Well, we decided early on that it, not only does it bring the kind of book alive, and it also is a sort of crossover for, for children who prefer to look at comics or comic books um, and feel more confident reading bubbles rather so, than reading blocks of text. Mm. Um, and you can be so much more uh, kind of expressive. You can have speech bubbles, you can have thought bubbles, you can have um, captions, you can have loud noises or quiet noises. Mm. And yeah, we just think that that really, really helps the page turn. Mm. And it does also help us cram in more information into those bubbles in a different way. Mm. Quite, a, quite a lot of our books are uh, structured in that way. So you have the main text and then you have the bubbles or this sort of short, easy reading facts. And then for uh, people who want to go more in depth, it's got often a little fact box. So mm. we've had some amazing uh, feedback from parents saying it works for all three of my children you know mm. so the yeah. youngest to the oldest and the yeah. speech bubbles can also lighten the mood if you've got a quite heavy bit of text then you can have some sort of light-hearted or i wouldn't say funny but light well, we don't really do funny but we can do light-hearted mm. interesting you talking about mood there because i think the other thing it does is it um, enhances the emotional engagement with character so your books are not about just information and facts they are about an emotional response Absolutely. to the subject as well yeah yeah they are i'm going to um, come to the audience i hope who're going to put some more questions in the question and answer box uh, we have only got another five oh, minutes so come along we want lots of questions otherwise we're going to turn the cameras on you and you all have to show your drawings that you did earlier <laughs> i would love that uh, unfortunately we can't but I would love to <laughs> be able to do that oh I tell you what we've got some suggestions coming through for topics books that people would like to see uh, yeah. Barbara Valentini has said she would like to see a book about Marco Polo mm. oh, that sounds interesting. interesting yeah so that's Silk Roads isn't it and Silk yeah. Roads, yeah. yeah put, a, put a note down I'll, I'll make a note of that <laughs> Is that they, that's something that's exciting that when we and Mark uh, embark on a book that might be somebody we don't know that much about, but we're, mm. we're passionate about. It's a journey for us too. Yeah, mm. yeah, we learn loads of things. It's Barbara, through. can I just ask you to put in the chat um, why Marco Polo? I'm interested to know why you picked him. And while, while, uh, while you're doing that, maybe somebody else will come up with uh, another question. So just waiting for Barbara to, uh, perhaps if she's got some time to, oh, 
Uh, we've already done uh, Sean's question, so we won't ask that one again. Um, in that case, because we are coming towards the last four minutes, I knew that it would um, absolutely, actually Barbara has come back. She said it would be nice to have the opportunity to have children study different civilizations. Mm. Oh, that'd be great. I'd love route, to uh, that, he, that he took. So that would be interesting. Yeah. That would um, be good. Some comments on Jane Austen. You'd never thought about Beatrix Potter? We did think about story. Beatrix Potter, but we were told that they were so, um, she's so protected um, okay. copyright wise that it would be almost impossible to do. Um, so we gave up with that one. Mm -hmm. But she would have a great story, the, the amount of conservation she work she did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with the national, you know, starting the National Trust in many ways. Yeah. But that, that's, that was. But we have thought about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And but, yeah. uh, we're getting lots of appreciation for Marco Polo coming through, just so that oh. you know. But I know you've got to feel passionate about it. So let, let's see what happens. Yeah. Um, we're coming to the end of the event and we were going to end with uh, Britta reading uh, the story that was particularly special to her, the story that started it all off, I think. Um, after that, um, I will obviously say the thank yous and wind the event up and as usual we'll leave the chat running for a little while but we will turn our cameras off so you don't feel that we're sitting there like lemons <laughs> so that's what we're going to do we're going to hear Britta read another story and then I'll close the event um, and thank you so much well thank you uh, well I've changed my mind I'm going to read um, uh, a little bit from well, it's the introduction, the introduction. Really, that Rita wrote for it. I think that's probably a good that's way to finish. That's a good it. way to finish. I loved making this book and choosing some of my heroes as examples of incredible courage, determination and power of women explorers from all over the world. For over 1,200 years, we women have led the way overcoming not only natural obstacles and dangers, but also the view that women should not take part in such activities at all. From Ord the Deep-Minded to Mae Jameson, from Sakawega to Barbara Hillary, women have explored and discovered from the seabed to outer space, and in the fields of science, history, archaeology, ecology, and social injustice. As you meet them and listen to their own amazing stories of travel and discovery, you will realize that not even the sky is the limit to what we women have achieved and can achieve in the future. As space explorer May Jameson tells us, it's your life. Go on and do all you can with it. Be inspired. Be yourself. Take up the challenge. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mick, Britta, thank you so much for a lovely evening and introducing us to the many women who led the way. Thank you to Otter Barry Books uh, for uh, putting on this event this evening as well and we will see you all soon uh we'll leave the chat running for a little while and i'll be in touch with you on the email so thank you so much thank you thank you bye, everybody bye <laughs> bye